Welcome to the Federalist Society's webinar call. Today, February 25th, we discuss Courthouse Steps' decision in Unicolors, Inc. v. H&M. My name is Guy DeSanctis, and I'm Assistant Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the expert on today's call. Today, we are fortunate to have with us Professor V. Rosen, an Assistant Professor at the Southern Illinois University School of Law and a former Abraham L. Kamenstein Scholar in residence at the U.S. Copyright Office. Throughout the panel, if you have any questions, please submit them through the question and answer feature or the chat so that our speakers will have access to them for when we get to that portion of the webinar. With that, thank you for being with us today. Z, the floor is yours. Thank you. So um, I have a short slide deck that I figured I would put on, um, help with some of this, given if it's a statutory case. Um, if a host could enable um, screen sharing, that would be great, and I'll put it up. Um, so this is probably an interesting case to talk about. I mean, there's so much else going on in the world today, and even at the Supreme Court. But I think it's kind of helpful to talk, to bear in mind, most of the court's work is still cases like this. I mean, this sort of fairly unheralded case about the details of copyright involving two players in the fashion industry, one of which you may have heard of and one of which you probably haven't heard of. And so, um, just wait, I'd like to get my um, screen sharing. Yeah, I'll, I'll work on turning that on now. Thank you. Um, well, while we wait for it to start, I can tell you a little bit about um, how this case started. Um, Unicolors is a company based in California that designs patterns. They design um, for all sorts of purposes, um, you know, fabric patterns mainly, et cetera. Um, they sued H&M, a company that you might be familiar with. Okay, we should be good to go now. Great, let's start the slideshow. And okay. so let's, great. Okay, so yeah. Unicolors versus Unicolors Inc. versus H&M. So Unicolors, as I mentioned, is a um, fabric design company. H&M is a fashion retailer, some of you may have heard of. The question presented, and we're gonna come back to this because it changes. Um, Unicolors wanted, um, or rather H&M wanted, um, no, rather Unicolors wanted the Supreme Court to consider two questions. First one, did the Ninth Circuit err in breaking its own prior precedent and the finding of other circuits in the Copyright Office and holding a 17 U.S.C. 411 required referral to the Copyright Office where there is no indicia of fraud or material errors for work at issue in the subject copyright registration? There was a second one they wanted as well, but the Ninth Circuit misapplying the publication standard. The court did not grant cert on the second question. We're gonna talk a little more about what this means, but generally speaking, section 411 is what's required. Um, oh, we'll, we'll, so this is section 411A. Um, you know, the United States retains requirement of copyright registration to bring a lawsuit, and you'll find this in section 411A. This says that subject to the provisions of subsection B, no civil action shall be, in, shall, shall, no civil action for infringement of copyright of any United States work, to be instituted until registration of a copyright claim has been made in accordance with this title. So what this means is for a United States work, and now foreign works are accepted from this, so you can comply with the Berne Convention and other international treaties. But for a domestic work in the United States, you can't bring an action for copyright infringement in civil court, in federal court, unless you've registered first. When you register with a copyright office, they you basically send in the um, application, you send in a fee, you send a deposit material. Corporate office then examines it and they choose to either accept or reject it. For, this is an edited version of 411A, a rejected application can still be used as a basis for a lawsuit. Congress added section 411B in 2008. It's part of a pro-IP act designed to really help copyright owners in lawsuits. It's a simplification, but a short version of it. 411B says that a certificate of registration is satisfied the requirements of 
um, this section, remember section 411A, so it does provide a basis for, for a lawsuit unless inaccurate information was included in the application with knowledge it was inaccurate. And I bolded that because that's the key question here. And secondly, the inaccurate information, if known, or register of copyrights to refuse registration. And then it says, in any case where inaccurate information is alleged, a court shall request register of copyrights to tell the court whether it would have refused re to register. This question at its core is what does it mean where, where a, a application was submitted with knowledge or is it with, or is inaccurate information? So this is registration itself. I pulled this off the Copyright Office's online catalog. Um, and this is, this is what you would know about EH101, which is the alleged infringing work. It's a um, so-called ethnic pattern. And the issue here, in essence, is that Unicolor sent this packet of 31 different patterns as artwork unbound sheets, but they called it one work. They did this mainly to avoid paying higher fees. And this has been a common practice for a long, long time. Um, back in the 30s, there was a major dispute over whether or not um, syndicated comic strips could be submitted in books or had registered individually. And everyone agreed that the, syndica the syndication companies were trying to dodge higher copyright fees by sending in books that collected a lot of them at one. Nonetheless, the DC Circuit in 1940 held that this was a valid publication and, and the Copyright Office couldn't deny registration. And their practice has remained to this day, sending in group registrations. However, the Copyright Office requires that something be a single unit of publication. The facts on, in this case regarding single unit of publication are a little murky. Um, pretty clearly on the relevant date of publication, Unicolors put all of these in their showroom. Unicolors argues that that constitutes publication. There is some argument that they, in fact, that's not really publication. They only distributed some of these, and only those that were actually distributed were published. Um, they really show sent as two different applications of published and unpublished material. And that's the accusation of. Um, making an um, incorrect statement via application and making it knowingly. Because if you know that you, presumably Unicolors knew what they did. They, un, they knew they hadn't sent all of these to dealers and other partners. But, you know, they included all 31 one application anyway. And so the question boils down to where they made a mistake of law, is that infringement? Now, the question presented, um, says, you know, there's no indicia of fraud or material error. And so that's a very high bar where a mistake of law, where if you grant it, you pretty much decide the question. But that's not quite where it went um, going down the road. The infringement is a tricky issue. And this is, co I've copied these from the plaintiffs, from both Unicolors and H&Ms filings in this case. Um, this is a joint appendix. You can see all of this online on the court docket. It really is a fascinating display of how one of them is, um, you know, how Unicolors really means to portray this as you know, says, hey, look, it's an exact copy. H&M is saying, these are nothing alike. And it's the same patterns and, and the same sweater. But one way or another, a jury did find this to be infringing. So the factual question of whether or not it's truly infringing is kind of irrelevant here. Jury said it is, we're not gonna second guess that. Um, after trial, Unical, Unic, um, h and moved for judgment as a matter of law, saying that there had been a material, saying that there had been a no, knowing misrepresentation on the copyright application that we just talked about. And so question is, is H&M entitled to, entitled to judgment as a matter of law on that basis? There is a lot of questions here about ch changing the question presented. And petitioners here do something that is definitely, um, I think, treading on um, 
fairly um, shaky ground. This is from a cert petition above. Did the Ninth Circuit error in breaking with its own prior president and holding other circuits in the Copyright Office and holding that 17 U.S.C. 411 requires a referral to the Copyright Office where there is no indicia of fraud or material error as to the work or at issue in the subject copyright registration? That's the cert petition question presented. Is there, you know, is the registration valid where there's no indicia of fraud or material error? That's not the issue they put in the brief. This isn't a question, this is copied from a question presented of a brief, so it's not deep in there. But this is how they stated in, in the question presented section of their brief. Whether the knowledge element precludes a challenge to registration where the inaccuracy resulted from applicants' good faith misunderstanding of a principle of copyright law. And this is what the case was actually argued as. Is, it, is a copyright registration invalid where the applicant made a good faith misunderstanding of a principle of copyright law? In other words, where they included works that, fit, that were both published and unpublished in one application saying they were all published, but didn't understand publication under copyright law. There's a fascinating colloquy in this case about whether or not pu pu publication by, you know, rather putting something in a showroom is publication or copyright law. The court does not get into that. They sort of reserve an assumption um, that there is. But it was a strange argument because, for starters, you have this fascinating, um, it's probably the most memorable part of the argument by Justice Breyer, where it starts talking about, oh, well, what about, you know, you know, if you're a bird watcher and you misrepresent what a bird is, um, one is making, one is using the wrong label, one is using, one is a mistake of fact, the other, the other is a mistake of law. And Justice Breyer includes this in his majority opinion, although he changes cardin, um, Oriole to Cardinal in the final opinion. Scarlet Tanagers are in both. I don't, it's one, I don't quite know why it's one of the interesting, um, little bits of this case. Um, but the case was argued. Um, a, a lot of people showed up as, as Amici in this case. Um, and by the way, I did do a separate post-argument um, uh, podcast for the Federal Society. So if you'd love to know more detail of your argument, you can hear it there. The big detail that the United States showed up at, um, and filed an amicus brief on behalf of Unicolors. And this case has a sort of strange complexion because not a lot of people actually agree, disagreed with Unicolors. The question was whether or whether the court should dismiss as improvidently granted. Copyright Alliance showed up on behalf of Unicolors, makes sense as trade group. The IP Law Association and American IP Law Association both um, filed briefs in favor of Unicolor, but rather we didn't, they actually, I put an asterisk there, we did not file a brief in favor of Unicolors per se, but they urged reversal. Uh, American Society of Media Photographers urged, urged reversal, joined by the California Society of Entertainment Lawyers, <coughs> pardon me, and also there was a brief from five IP professors, and, and I joined that brief. What we argued is that the history and text of the statute is pretty clear that you know, that a innocent mistake is not enough to invalidate a registration. On the flip side, you have to excuse my typo of New York um, um, IP Law Association. There were recent 12, 12 uh, IP professors at Center for Democracy and Technology and Electronic Frontier Front Foundation. Um, their briefs were more focused on what they call the copyright troll aspect of this case which is that Unicolor is in the business of making all these patterns for um, fabric and then suing people. And they say, oh, you're really just copyright trolls. You sue a lot of people. And we, we want the court to crack down on that. But they weren't really arguing, at least to my read, per se about this individual case, so much as urging the court to be wary of a broader context of this lawsuit. And I think they wanted a dismissal that providently granted out of concern is would empower um, people like Unicolors um, in what they consider to be bad faith actions. Um, National Retail Federation filed a map of H&M, once again, not a shock is our trade group. 
um, California Fashion Association and two individuals, a law professor and practicing lawyer and two practicing lawyers. So those were the people who filed amicus briefs in this case and sort of gives you an idea about for broader issues going in. Justice Breyer, what might be his last IP opinion on the court, which is kind of fascinating. I mean, if Google versus, or versus Oracle, I almost said Google versus Oriole, which kind of summarizes the year of IP for him, but if Google versus Oracle was his big final statement on IP, this is sort of a coda. It's not a big case, but it's, he, Justice Breyer has been involved in copyright for going on 50 years now ever since he wrote his tenure article for Harvard. Um, and here, somewhat surprisingly, he takes a pro-copyright hold, pro holder stance, but the decision makes more sense when you look at for broader currents, I believe, in Justice Breyer's um, judicature. So what does he say? This is for opening his opinion. The question of force concerns the scope of this phrase with knowledge that it was inaccurate in, um, in section 411B. The Court of Appeals believe that copyright holder cannot benefit from a safe harbor and savings registration if it's a lack of knowledge jumped from failure to understand the law rather than a failure to understand the facts. In other words, where they, where they knew what they were doing, they just didn't understand the legal significance. In our view, however, 411B does not distinguish between a mistake of law and a mistake of fact. Lack of knowledge either fact or law can excuse an inaccuracy in a copyright registration. They therefore vacate the Court of Appeals contrary holding and they remand. Why? And this is what I said about Justice Breyer's um, judicature. He looks at, look at the statute, look at dictionaries, look at what knowledge is, is supposed to be. Look at our section of Title 17, which, you know, talk about knowledge of both fact and law. A big thing for Justice Breyer, and this is something, this is where I said it taps into some prior currents in his judicature, is that he has a look at legislative history. In this case, legislative history is really clear that Congress amended 411 to add 411B in 2008, specifically to make it harder to show fraud on the Copyright Office and to make it more likely that a copyright registration is going to be held valid. And you know, that a lot of uh, case law before 2008 also held that a, mere mistake as to, that a mere mistake as to the law does not constitute fraud on the Copyright Office. So, Part three of, you, of a decision is basically Justice Breyer responding to a few um, comments and questions. I should say this is a very, very short opinion. Um, the majority is only, is I think um, nine or 12 pages. And this is just a page or two of responding. The court has this caveat that willful blindness is still knowledge. And I saw some people sent, who were uh, supporting H&M saying, well, you know what, okay, at, le at least this does not change status quo all that much. Um, briefly argues a knowledge question. Um, and basically, and we'll get into this in a minute with dissent, but he says, listen, this was a subsidiary question fairly included in a petition's question presented that, you know, about the meaning of knowledge, even though we mentioned question presented had been changed by, the, by petitioners. Very brief, he spends like a paragraph on it, maybe two. Um, and it's vacated and remanded. We get a short dissent from Justice Alito, well, from Justice Thomas, joined by Alito and partially Gorsuch. Justice Thomas really homes in on the problem of the of procedure here. They listen, having persuaded us to grant certiorari on this issue. Unicolors has chosen to rely on a different argument in his merits briefing. He no longer argues that 411B1A requires fraudulent intent, instead proposes a novel actual knowledge standard. Because I would not reward Unicolors for its ledger main, and no other court had before today ever addressed whether 411B1A requires actual knowledge, I would dismiss Rita's Rita certiorari as improvidently granted. Justice Alito joins a whole dissent. Justice Gorsuch agrees only on this point. So he, Justice Gorsuch would have dismissed as improvidently granted, but wouldn't go any further. Justice Thomas, in his second part, only drawn by Justice Alito, says, in this case, of course, misstep comes at considerable cost. A requirement to know the law is ordinarily satisfied by constructive knowledge, because actual knowledge of illegality can be difficult or impossible to prove. Yet here the court imposes an actual knowledge of the law standard that is virtually unprecedented 
such as criminal tax enforcement. And he says, if a court reads 411B1A to be of a lone exception, it's dubious. If a court does so that permitting any other court in the country to first consider the question is unwise. He just missed a case that is improvidently granted and let, and let the Ninth Circuit's decision stand. Obviously, you know, this is what H&M wanted because if it's dismissed as improvidently granted, Ninth Circuit decision stands. Um, but either way, the court embraces actual, uh, embraces actual knowledge and, and reverses and, and remands back to the court to determine whether there was actual knowledge of fraud. So that's my little slideshow here. Um, and if people have questions about this case, I'd love to hear of them. It's kind of been talked about as perhaps a not, a not as important case, um, even by people in a copyright world. But it's the Supreme Court stepping in. There's potential precedents here about what happens when a question presented has changed. Um, it definitely clarifies that as long as you in good faith submit your registration, it's not going to be invalidated in litigation. It also further strengthens the practice of doing these group registrations and not worrying quite as much about whether or not something is published. This is one of the major concerns if you file a registration, getting straight if something is truly published or not. Publication can be a very difficult doctrine to understand in the context of copyright law. And this takes a little bit of pressure of copyright owners. And one of the things I said in the amicus brief I signed, I shouldn't say I said, I, I, well, I signed it with that main drafter, is that there's a real concern about small, medium-sized businesses not understanding publication. You might have one general counsel who does everything from employment to tax and everything in between, and we're also gonna be responsible for copyright. We're not gonna know this convoluted 200, 200 years of publication, what it means. And by saying that a honest, an honest mistake of law as a publication is not going to invalidate for registration, it's potentially a real benefit to small, medium-sized businesses where their innocent mistakes are not going to be penalized. So yeah, the floor is open. People have any questions about this case, anything they want to know about? Give people a minute to um, be a little less shy. I will say there's a fascinating, um, the whole issue of group registration has come up some and the, and the copyright office has been increasingly, I think allowing these group registrations. You've had a couple of recent, um, additions to copyright the procedure, like I've added a group registration of short online works, meant for registration of blogs, et cetera. We also, you've also procedures for group registration of an album where you can register sound recording, the musical compositions and any artwork or textual material in one. And you're allowed to do group registrations of other materials in a single unit of publication. And so, I think if you are a small business and a classic example is a wedding photographer, there's no way you're going to register every photo individually, but you might want to register um, them as a group. I have a question here. Why is the Supreme Court so forgiving on copyright, but in patent, I look for any reason to invalidate a patent. They'll never forgive an honest mistake. Rather, they stick it to a patent donor. It's an interesting question. Um, you know, I mean, those of us in copyright world, you know, are certainly aware that the PTAB has been criticized for being much more aggressive. Um, I think the reason is that in copyright, in copyright, the office is much more an office of registration. And in other words, if the copyright office is not actually granting the right, they're simply providing a stamp on it. If it gives you standing to sue, it gives you additional damages. Whereas in patent law, there's a feeling that we're actually given the right. But it's certainly a fair question. And you could certainly ask, why wasn't this a design patent in the first place? You'd think that a fabric design, you know, or designed for whatever it is, would, you know, 
potentially fit better as a design. And in fact, designs have always been in this um, awkward, awkward place between copyright and patent. Um, so that's my best answer. I think that um, because there, it seems less at stake because the copyright is going to be good anyway. I mean, pretty clearly, if um, if Unicolor is resubmitted via application, se separating out published and unpublished, the main thing they would lose, if they wouldn't lose much at all, I think they got um, actual damages, not statutory damages. And so all they'd have to do was refile the action. And so we say there's already, already a jury verdict. They'd probably try to argue it's collateral estoppel or res judicata and try to get the court to reinforce it based on that. And that I think is probably why, um, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, while we see if there are any more questions, is there anything else you'd like to elaborate on or anything like that? Well, you know, it's a, um, it was one of the interesting things that the court took this case. Um, a, lot of, a lot of us were sort of scratching our heads a little bit because it's, it's an interesting case. I mean, is it error correction? Is it something else? It's hard to know. Um, I wonder if a court, and there's often been speculation a court likes taking um, occasional IP cases that are not overly controversial, compare it to Oracle versus Google, which is, you know, it's an IP case that is controversial. Um, and there's a lot of speculation whether I mean, the court is kind of like considering taking the certiorari in. Um, Goldsmith versus Warhol, I believe, a case about um, a photograph of Prince and whether a reinterpretation of it um, by Andy Warhol is infringing. Um, and that's I mean, a much bigger case that goes to what the meaning of fair use is following Google versus Oracle. I think here the court sort of saw a technical issue that where, where maybe some error correction was needed and they chose to jump in. Um, yeah, I don't really have a, it's not, it's a short, short opinion in sort of a weird little case where the court almost certainly shouldn't have taken it. And I think I was kind of, I was kind of suspecting the court would dismiss as improvidently granted, um, which is what three of justices would have done. Maybe they wanted to give Justice Breyer an additional um, take on copyright law where he talked about legislative history also. I don't know. I don't really have, there's not really too, I mean, I'm happy to answer more questions, but I don't have a ton else to say about it. Yeah, I guess we'll wrap up then. Thank you. Thank you very much, really. Um, it's always interesting to discuss, discuss copyright before the court, and we'll see if there's, and I'm sure there's more coming down a pike. Yeah. On behalf of the Federalist Society, I want to thank our expert for the benefit of his valuable time and expertise today, and I want to thank our audience for joining and participating. We also welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. As always, keep an eye on our website and your emails for announcements about upcoming teleform calls and virtual events. Thank you all for joining us today. We are adjourned. <laughs>